Is it very cool, super cool to be nominated for Grammy? Of course, that's so great. As I must come back to you, I will pour into that one note all the love I feel for you. Stacey Ken is not just a Grammy-nominated jazz singer. She is a musician that brings back the heart and soul of Bossa Nova. With several British Jazz Awards and gold and platinum albums under her belt, this interview demonstrates why Stacey Kent has personal achievements that shine brighter than any award. So Stacey Kent, we're here following the release of your much-awaited album, Tenderly. Can you tell us a bit about this album and what it meant for you? Yeah, this meant so much to me because, um, I mean, they all do for their own particular reasons. This was spectacular and special because of Roberto Menescal, who plays guitar on the album. And I have to explain for people who don't know Roberto Menescal, they will know him by his music, but not necessarily by his name. Roberto is one of the fathers of bossa nova, huge Brazilian music um, and movement that uh, came about in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, with the fathers like Roberto Menescal, Jobim, Joel Roberto, Vinicius de Moraes. These are these guys are my heroes. You know, these are the people I grew up listening to when I was 14 years old and I discovered Bossa Nova. Um, they came into my life. And um, I met Roberto when I was asked to perform at the 80th birthday celebration of the statue of Christ the Redeemer, O Cristo Redentor, down in Brazil. Uh, already it was a hugely exciting night because um, it was an all Brazilian event to celebrate this birthday and there was a huge concert out on the beach and you're overlooking you, you can see Corcovado all lit up in the distance it was magic and they only invited two non-Brazilians to partake and that they were myself and my husband Jim so what a complete knockout experience because these people who are our heroes to, to be embraced back by a country and a culture that has meant so much to us and fueled us musically was just huge you can imagine so I was coming off the stage after having sung my song and coming up the stairs to go perform his was Roberto Menescal. We had never seen each other. Um, I knew his name and his face very well from all sorts, movies, yeah. books, you know, all sorts. And there he was in front of me and I just went, Roberto, because I was just so <laughs> shocked that he was right there. I didn't know he was on the bill. And he went, Stacy. And what was weird was I had no idea that he knew who I was because I'm some girl singer from North America. How would, you know, we don't cross paths except here, you know. And um, he started to name my albums to me and said, my wife Yara and I listen to you all the time. You're my favorite North American singer. And uh, we became friends. So we exchanged emails and we started emailing each other back and forth. And the reason I have to tell you this whole story is because when he came to make this album with us, Tenderly, it wasn't simply me making some calls to some great musicians to say, come and be my, on my record. This was a, a very beautiful friendship that started to, to heat up because of that meeting. And um, it was good that we had so long to become friends because I think I would have been nervous in the studio playing with one of my heroes, Roberto Menescal. Of course. And he became a real mentor and, and friend to me. And we realized how much we have in common, even though we are from such different worlds and different generations. Um, this was a, a magnificent, profound friendship that, that got together. And now the reason I have to tell you all that, and to answer your question why this is special, Roberto had never made an album of standards before. He's made a gazillion albums. Uh, and produced a gazillion albums, but all down in Brazil and a little bit of music outside of that, but not really the American songbook. Mm -hmm. And he came and recorded with us on our previous album, which was kind of a Brazilian album, The Changing Lights. And he sort of confessed to me that um, he had never made a standards album and it was his dream to make an album of standards and to do it with me. And I was completely knocked out that he would want to do this. He grew up on people like Barney Kessel, Julie London, and he loves that intimacy of the standards. People who do know his music from Brazil will know that um, he's very well known for playing. He likes that singer guitarist intimate relationship. He's very into these duos. Um, and there are some very famous uh, recordings of, of him with some great singers. And he loves that intimacy of the voice and the guitar. But he did it in Brazil, and now he wanted to do it with the American Songbook. And that is the whole story as to why this album came about. It was really his idea, his dream, which was mine too, 
and so his baby. So when we came to make Tenderly, the reason it was so special is because, you know, I kept pinching myself that I'm here with Roberto Menescal recording in this very intimate way. How did this even happen to me, you see? And that's why I feel so um, exhilarated by the project. It's not simply a collection of beautiful songs. Moi, je l'aime, mais j'ai pas curé le monde En cherchant ses racines vagabondes Aujourd'hui, pour trouver les plus profondes C'est la simple chanson qu'il faut chanter Yeah, and I think that the sound from Brazil, it's inevitable that it's on this album because Roberto plays in a particular way. Um, you know, I keep using the word intimate uh, to be more specific. There's a lot of space. There's a lot of quiet. And I think that we transported that atmosphere, that universe, to this with the standards. The idea behind this album was to make, not, not to go big, but to go kind of, no, not kind of at all, to go completely the opposite direction, like we're just in this vacuum. It's very pure, it's extremely intimate, and it's very bare. Um, that's kind of daunting in itself, because there's nowhere to hide. You know, there's, it relies on me to sing well. I mean, you hear my voice. If you hear a band with, you know, 10 people in it, and there's trumpets and this and that going on, you can, you can kind of hide away and, and this is so exposed that nobody can afford to make a, a it's a turn of phrase to say make a wrong move, but that's not how music works. It's not about wrong move. It's, but it's so exposed that you've, you're just on all the time and you've got to make sure that it's good. And I, I think that the reason this works so well, um, the American Songbook and the way in which Roberto works in, in Brazilian music, is because the songs themselves are so strong. Harmonically, they're strong. Poetically, they're strong. Um, everything about them is just so whole and beautiful and fully formed. And it doesn't need a lot. And um, it's funny because with Roberto, as I was saying, he's played with so many of the, the great Brazilian singers over the years. And sometimes they are big bands and it's a lot of, you know, action and activity and rhythm and sound and groove and all of that. But his favorite stuff is born out of the origins of Bossa Nova. En vain, me chanter le romance Douterais-tu le printemps It's funny to hear the words bold and brave um, because you're in your music and you're so in it and you have this passion for it and you're not thinking in terms of, you know, how can I do something really daring? It's not like the guy, the Frenchman who, who threw the line across from one of the Twin Towers to the other and, you know, walked the tightrope from one to the other. You know, that's bold um, and very scary. In music, Yes, you might be taking chances, but I don't think you think of it in those terms. You just, you find your way according to, if you're lucky, you know yourself well, you know what it is that you want to play, and you find your way through the music. I think people referred to me as bold and brave at that point because they knew me as a standard singer. And I love the standards. I'm still singing them. But what they're referring to is the fact that I started singing a lot of material that was coming from my husband, the composer Jim Tomlinson, and the great novelist, they're both great, and they're a great partnership. Kazuo Shiguro. Um, and what a songwriting team they are. It's unbelievable, the songs they come up with for me. And um, I think that reference is because I started to sing songs. Honestly, it didn't feel like it was brave because they were so me. They were so tailor-made for me. And I, I want to explain that when I was singing the standards, if I'm perfectly honest with you, as much as I loved them, I felt an itch. I felt like something was missing, and that's what was missing. And I want to explain what that is. Um, that is to say that in the Great American Songbook, the formula is this. The singer sings the song. It's 32 bars long, for the most part, unless it's a Cole Porter song and it's longer, but it's 32 bars. And then the band comes in, and the instrumentals happen, and there's some solos, and then the singer sings it out. And there's a real formula. Now, the reason there's a formula is because it works. But if you do that time and time again, um, something feels something's missing, something's, something for me was frustrating. And I think it's because 
you know, I'm such a lyric-oriented singer. I love the story. And I didn't like that there was this song, then the instrumentals, then me. Um, I asked Jim Tomlinson and Kazuo Shiguro to write me songs when we started that were through composed. In other words, the story, and they're long stories. They're good, developed. It's like a whole lifetime in a matter of five minutes. The story lasts all the way through the song. And the solos are still there. The, the improvisation for the musicians is still there, but they no longer have that chunk of the 32 bars on which to play. And it made everything all the more exciting, actually. There's Graham on the piano suddenly infusing the music with something that he hears from the lyric, and he plays something, you know, obligato behind me, around me. And then there are these points where Ishiguro might have you lyrically want to show the passage of time. This isn't visual, but it might as well be. There's like a montage. And that's where the solo would come in. So it leaves the listener and the singer, the protagonist, time to reflect on what's just happened. Fatigué, désabusé, sans courage, impatiente, je ne sais plus ce qui m'attend. Je sens arriver l'orage. That was a really interesting time. Because, do you know who the Little Rascals are? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> you should check them out on YouTube. <laughs> this is this is a, a TV show for kids, way before my time. Um, it's from the 30s. I have a feeling I don't know everything about it, but I have a feeling that they might have been shorts at the movies because there wasn't TV back then. Of course. But my mother knew them. You know, they're they're basically her generation, and they're these kids. Um, acting like grown-ups, kind of Bugsy Malone-ish, but before then. And um, there was a lot of jazz. You know, you asked me about where I found the jazz in the first place. Yeah. There was so much jazz in that television show and other things that I grew up just watching. Swing music, little girls standing in front of orchestras, you know, kind of doing this. And I grew up on that stuff, and I loved it. And um, so when I sang with the swing band, this 30 swing band, you know, in the Ritz Hotel, and it was so beautiful, you know, the whole, I was in a big gown, and we're in this beautiful room, and the, I'm with this orchestra playing this fantastic, arra um, these arrangements that are original arrangements transcribed, you know, they weren't just stock, perfunctory yeah. arrangements. Um, I was in heaven, I was flying, I loved it, but that was so early on for me. I don't think, you know, it was a novelty, and it was fun, and it taught me a lot. Um, but there was no way I could have done that for a whole career. You know, the itch that I was talking about was eventually going to come. It was fun, but it was a novelty. Um, and it launched me into great places. Quiet thoughts and quiet dreams. Quiet walks by quiet streams. And a window looking onto Coco Vado. Oh, how lovely. This is where I want to be Here with you so close to me It's funny because you know how we were talking about earlier um, in terms of the bold, brave new Kent or um, the way that people perceive you from the outside. Um, the same goes, the same applies here in that, yes, of course there have been achievements. Is it very cool, super cool to be nominated for Grammy, of course, and to win certain awards that I've won, won along the years, um, along the way. Of course, that's so great, but it's nothing compared to when you do a show and you go to a signing and you meet somebody afterwards and they touch your arm and they look at you with this look on their face and might say, I don't know, I've had a terrible year and you got me through it or something very personal goes on you know it's so beautiful when people are personally touched and and let you know that and they don't even have to tell you that it's just something that you feel it's an intangible you're in the theater it's so ephemeral you've made this music with your musicians whom you love I love those guys that I play with and you um you share a moment I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's so human I mean, it's so human to make music. And it's funny to say that because in the world in which we live today, where, you know, you go in Times Square and there's, you know, big lights and everything, everything, and you're just, it's just media overload. 
And, you know, there is room for that because it would be fun to go to Las Vegas and see a big show and it's on a huge stage and there's dry ice and there are swings and there are dancers and there's, you know, just craziness. You know, the, the circus too. It's, um, you know, it, things have... Entertainment has always had that, those aspects. I mean, now we're talking about technology, but pre-technology, pre, you know, craziness and lights and video behind the, um, the, the artists, there was always that kind of um, stuff going on. And it was always magical. It's always fun. But we can't let that overtake the world of music like that's all that counts. People are still really touched by and need, um, you know, one man with his guitar, watching, you know, James Taylor, he'll be with his band, but he'll do a song, just James Taylor and that voice and his songs and that guitar. That is so powerful. And I think for him, I don't know, I met him once, I opened for him in Montreux, and he's a really super nice guy. But I think that the thing, the sense that you get is that for him and for many people, it's so human. And so going back to what your question was about you know, Grammy Awards and, and all sorts of awards and um, all of that that has happened. I mean, I got one very cool one, which was the Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres in France, which was huge for me because I was being thanked by the French culture, French government yeah. for bringing French culture around the world. And that meant a lot to me because I grew up speaking French. My grandpa lived in France for so many years. That was very personal and that was, that was exhilarating. Um, so I'm not going to lie that none of them are... are, are touch you in that exhilarating sort of way. But it is the humanity in music. I tour with my husband, my best friend, my saxophone and flute player, my producer, Jim Tomlinson. Um, in the times off, it's not that we're, we're not on tour, but we get to work on the music. And this is an important year because next year will be an album making year. We've got something cooking right now. We have a lot of work to do. And uh, truth be told, we're not good at working we're not good at multitasking. We're not good at working on the record when we're on the road. We're exhausted and we've got our energy. You're not so exhausted that you can't perform. You want to perform live. That's what you're fueled by. But you can't spend, you know, hours in the airport uh, while waiting for the next plane to work profoundly on the next project. You can get a little work done, but it's more superficial. So I like the way the tour works because there's on-tour work and then there's off-tour work. And then we can... Like with Breakfast on the Morning Train, we took a lot of time off uh, beforehand to prepare those songs and to prepare the band. And then we went in and made the record and then we went on tour and that's what will happen next year. So I really like this rhythm. Fantastic. Well, Stacey Kent, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you. Really nice to talk to you. Thank you. And your friends began to sing When you wish upon a star And you clapped along like you didn't have